Today, I have the happy task of introducing Amanda Salvi, who rises to defend her PhD dissertation on a new set of plant adaptations to drought. Uh, I first met Amanda uh, while visiting the University of Michigan in 2015 to give the, the Wagner lecture. While there, I visited uh, with Selena Smith and had the great good fortune uh, to talk about research with her brightest student. Um, Anna was finishing her undergrad thesis on venation in the Zingiberales, the monocot order of gingers and their relatives, and had conducted field research in the rainforests of Costa Rica, working on the ecology of uh, the spiral uh, uh, gingers. It was immediately apparent that Amanda had exceptional promise and that we shared uh, many interests in functional ecology and evolution. So I immediately set out to recruit her for graduate studies. It was a good decision. Um, in 2016, Amanda was named the uh, Botanical Society of America Outstanding Young Botanist and received a coveted NSF Graduate uh, Research Fellowship. Amanda has always shown intelligence and tenacity, graduating as co-valedictorian uh, at her high school near Crystal Lake in Illinois and helped win a championship there in water polo. Once uh, Amanda arrived here in uh, 2016, she took on me and Kate McCullough as co-advisors which turned, about, turned out to be highly productive uh, for uh, all three of us. Kate and I had just landed a $1 million grant from NSF to study why 10 eucalyptus species dominated different portions of a rainfall gradient in Victoria, Australia, running from temperate rainforest to arid scrub. Uh, and uh, we were investigating how uh, that arose based on variation in the photosynthetic physiology and hydraulics of those species. I suggested uh, to Amanda, uh, that uh, she explores some ideas that had long been at the heart of my own interests in physiological ecology, and which I believe are fundamental uh, to the ecology and evolution of land plants, and especially to how they balance photosynthesis with the water loss that inevitably accompanies it. Uh, these um, questions are also of great interest to Kate, and fortunately for us, and for the field as a whole, Amanda thought so too, and plunged into studying uh, what we term mesophyll photosynthetic uh, sensitivity, uh, revealing a new dimension of plant adaptations to uh, relative moisture supply. Now, earning uh, a PhD is a great challenge. You will be pushed to realize all of your potential. You must be brave enough to confront uncertainties on your part, on your advisor's parts, and on the part of the broader field. You will have to work hard, often alone, but also remain sane uh, by having a good work-to-life uh, balance. You have to be competitive and yet forge productive relationships with your colleagues. You have to cope with inevitable anxiety and set that against the exhilaration of creativity and discovery of changing how we see and understand the world. We advisors do our best to help our students. We share their excitement as new findings and ideas emerge and share inspirational experiences in class and in the field. We assist them in fulfilling, finding fulfilling jobs. And then after four or five years, we must wave goodbye. Uh, it's bittersweet. Our hope is that the world is a better place for our advisees and that the world is a better place because of them. Amanda has played a major role in Kate's lab and my own, and has capitalized on the strengths of all her committee members. Amanda uh, was outstanding in my plant ecology courses, including eight field trips in Wisconsin and an eight day field trip uh, to the Southern Appalachians. She joined uh, Kate and me on our Australian uh, field course in 2018, including four days on Huron Island uh, on uh, the Great Barrier Reef, uh, two weeks in Victoria, uh, including research on eucalyptus, and then another week with me and two other students in Western uh, Australia, uh, visiting the most diverse temperate plant communities on Earth, while hunting for the remarkable genus Borea and several other uh, rare plants. Amanda has had the opportunity to return to Australia two more times to assist uh, with research and collaborate with our postdoc Duncan Smith on his own heroic research uh, efforts there. And as you can see, uh, Amanda is ever multitasking here, having lunch while uh, making measurements. Um, last summer, uh, Amanda won an award for the best student presentation in ecophysiology at the Botanical Society of America. She's collaborated with Steve Augustine on another project, not in her thesis, involving an unusual means of achieving uh, shade tolerance in Leatherwood. 
And finally, in terms of maintaining a great uh, work-life balance, uh, Amanda met the love of her life, Chris Simmons, here in Madison, and married him uh, this spring during the, the pandemic while finishing her thesis, while submitting two papers, all in only four years. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, please welcome Amanda Salvi, who will speak today on mesophyll photosynthetic sensitivity and its relationship to climate and other traits. Oh my gosh, Tom, thank you so much. I was on the verge of tears pretty much that whole time, so thank you. And I'm gonna want copies of a lot of those photos that I hadn't seen before. <laughs> Seriously, thank you for that introduction. Oh my gosh. Um, I will say the uh that water polo championship was actually an inner tube water polo championship in college. So a little more whimsical and less impressive, although we did beat the um ROTC Navy team to get that title. Um, so I am very proud of it. Okay. So give me a second to share my content. I'm surprised I didn't cry, that was amazing. Okay, so hopefully, <laughs> and she's humble. <laughs> I worked hard for that inner, inner tube water polo championship. I'm assuming you see my PowerPoint, now I just have to. We can see it. Great, you're reading my notes. Yes. That's You're reading my notes. It's embarrassing. <laughs> okay, now it looks super. Great. Um, well, thanks everyone for joining. I see a lot of people here today early on a Monday morning, and I've been receiving text messages of congratulations and good lucks all morning. Um, so seriously, thank you. Uh, I feel so loved right now. It's amazing. Um, all right. So Today I'll be talking about the work I've been doing over the last four years here in these wonderful labs, and hopefully my computer will let me move slides. Right. <clears throat> so terrestrial plants have a huge impact on carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere, accounting for almost 60% of global carbon dioxide uptake. And we see this impact every single year during spring and summer of the Northern Hemisphere, where plants with newly developed leaves and plenty of sunlight absorb a huge amount of carbon dioxide through photosynthesis, which is their method of acquiring energy for growth. There's understandably a lot of interest in understanding, modeling, and predicting these global effects of plant photosynthesis, given their huge impact. But modeling at larger scales requires a basic understanding of plant physiology at small scales. For example, to understand how a dry year affects the global carbon balance, we need to understand how, carb how drought affects an individual plant. Now, plants are complex creatures, but there is a fundamental limitation to photosynthesis in terrestrial plants. And that's caused by the link between diffusion of carbon dioxide into a leaf and water out of the leaf through stomata. So for plants to acquire carbon dioxide for photosynthesis, stomata must open to allow carbon dioxide to enter. But that at the same time results in transpiration of water out of the stomata. Thus, any adaptation that maximizes photosynthesis, photosynthetic carbon gain, at the same time incurs a cost penalty by its inescapable effect on water loss. So as a consequence, benefits of traits that increase photosynthesis and carbon acquisition have to be weighed against the potential costs of increased water loss. But the optimization of this balance between the two depends on the environment. Now, when plants are faced with water shortages, um, and that could happen on a daily, seasonal, or annual ba uh, basis, they experience declines in photosynthetic rates. So here's a figure displaying um, that common plant response to drought. Let me turn on my laser pointer and pretend I'm using a real one in a room. 
So on the x-axis is leaf water potential, which is just a way to quantify how dehydrated the plant is, um, where more negative values mean a this leaf water potential is often um, denoted with a uh, Greek symbol psi or psi leaf. Um, so more negative water potentials mean a drier status, and as the plant becomes drier, photosynthesis declines. This decline in photosynthesis is typically attributed to stomatal closure. So as water becomes more limiting within the plant, plants are less willing to expend water out via transpiration. Now, an important thing to keep in mind is that the exchange rate for water to carbon dioxide is actually really bad for plants. There is extensive loss of water for every single molecule of carbon dioxide gained. So plants under dry conditions tend to close their stomata, limiting a huge source of water loss and preventing further dehydration. But that also means a, a decrease in the amount of carbon dioxide diffusing into the leaf which in turn means lower photosynthesis. So stomata close and photosynthesis declines. But this limitation of photosynthesis, what we call stomatal limitations, is not the only process causing these declines in photosynthesis. There are also non-stomatal limitations, and these are inhibitory mechanisms that occur within the leaf in what we call mesophyll cells. So let me explain visually what is the difference between the two stomatal limitations and non-stomatal limitations. So here we have what's called an ACI curve. Um, and it's abbreviated this way because it compares photosynthesis, which is uh, normally abbreviated as A, um, often abbreviated as A, um, compared to the concentration of carbon dioxide inside the leaf. So that's CI. So this curve shows how photosynthesis in as CO2 concentrations inside the leaf increase. With uh, initial increases in CI, photosynthesis increases very rapidly, but eventually tapers off to the maximum value of that leaf. And when plants experience water stress, they close their stomata, and this reduces the CI of the leaf and subsequently reduces photosynthesis following the trend of an ACI curve. This is stomata limitation. If stomata were to reopen, CI would increase and so would photosynthesis following the ACI curve. Non-stomata limitation, however, involves a lowering of the entire um, response curve here from red to blue. And this happens as leaf water potential drops. So if we look at any given value of CI, net photosynthesis has declined compared to the red curve. And during water stress, uh, and so, yes, okay, so we call this non stomatal limitation because there's no change in CI, but photosynthesis is still reduced. Um, and during water stress, both stomatal and non stomatal limitations can occur. So these ACI curves are a way we can account for the stomatal limitations and attain an, est an estimate of the non-stomatal limitations. If we measure several ACI curves as leaf water potential declines over some days of drought, we can estimate how sensitive the plant is to these non-stomatal limitations. And so we call this mesophyll photosynthetic sensitivity to leaf water potential, or MPS, I'll call it a lot in this talk. And this MPS may have been a fundamental constraint on terrestrial plant evolution, selecting for the rise and optimization of key traits that function to conserve or even access water, such as stomata or roots. Yet to date, very little is known about the variation in MPS among species, and especially in the context of plant ecology. So this was the goal of my work over the last four years um, to better uh, measure, to, was over the last four years was to measure how mesophyll photosynthetic sensitivity to leaf water potential differs among closely related but ecologically different species. In this way, we hope to better understand plant response to drought in a novel way. 
And here's some of the questions I had throughout my studies, which I'll use to guide my talk today. First, how does mesophyll photosynthetic sensitivity differ across environments, specifically across environments that differ in the moisture availability of the environment? How do functional hydraulic and photosynthetic traits, how are they coordinated across the plant? And are there any possible trade-offs to having, having greater or lessened sensitivity? And finally, how does mesophyll photosynthetic sensitivity correlate with other uh, drought tolerant traits, especially those that are currently being used to model and predict plant drought responses? So for my talk today, I'm going to answer these questions by focusing on one of my study systems, and um, today it'll be eucalyptus. This genus is huge with more than 700 species. They are widely planted and economically important and have a great diversity in height and plant form. And these species have narrow distributions across impressive climate gradients in Australia. Um, we studied 10 upland evergreen species of within two subgenera of eucalyptus. So that would be eucalyptus and then symbiomyrtus. And these species have ranges that are distributed um, along huge moisture gradients in Victoria, Australia. Our species range from the very wet adapted eucalyptus regnans um, in the bottom right hand corner. And this is actually the tallest angiosperm uh, species in the world. And then um, species that range to much, much drier conditions in the interior of Australia and everywhere in between. Um, so first we quantified, I quantified the aridity of the species home ranges. And um, to do this, I compared what's called the P over EP. And that's just the amount of precipitation in the area divided by the amount of pan evaporation, which is the ability of the environment to evaporate water. So it gives us an idea of um, what is the moisture of that environment, moisture levels, um, where higher PEPs mean a more mesic, uh, moist environment. So here are the, the means and standard deviations across each species native um, distributions in Australia. The 10 species we're working with are closely related um, eucalyptus species within two subgenera. And here's a phylogenetic tree showing these relationships. The divergence of the two um, subgenera dates back nearly to the origin of the genus eucalyptus. And the rapid diversification um, within the, of our species within the two subgenera coincides with the most recent aridification event that happened in Australia, um, shown by the orange sun. And this implies that their divergence may have been driven by this aridification. Furthermore, insights um, from these species should be particularly powerful because they have only recently radiated, which means the observed changes would likely be the result of selection on specific traits that allow for survival and less so on genetic drift. Come on, commuter. Great. Okay, so our first hypothesis um, today is that. Species from drier habitats uh, will show less mesophyll photosynthetic sensitivity to declines in leaf water potential. And we expect this pattern because the ability to perform photosynthesis uh, at lower leaf water potentials should itself be a favorable, favorable trait in drier environments. So I grew tons of these 10 species in a greenhouse in UW Madison, uh, collecting the data in the summer, summer and fall of 2018. So I, I grew the plants originally under well watered conditions and took good care of them um, and then put them through uh, a drought experiment where I stopped watering them. And then I collected several of the ACI curves that I was talking about. Um, so each of the curves was taken um, at a more and more negative leaf water potential. And these measurements to quantify mesophyll photosynthetic sensitivity within each species and then accounted for phylogenetic relationships in all of our statistical analyses. But eyeballing these curves isn't enough to get an idea of what the sensitivity to leaf water potential is. 
So for every ACI curve, I uh, quantified something called A max, which is the maximum gross photosynthetic rate. And from the ACI curve, um, that's essentially the asymptote plus respiration. And so then I modeled the response of AMAX to leaf water potential within each species. And here's what that looks like when I plot it out. Um, so on the x-axis is leaf water potential status for the leaf. And then it acts on the y-axis. So at higher leaf water potential, less negative leaf water potentials, um, max rate of photosynthesis, uh, it's the max rate of and um, then the photosynthesis starts declining as the leaf becomes drier. Um, and then, so using this, I fit a sigmoidal equation to it um, and uh, was able to then use this equation to quantify mesophyll photosynthetic sensitivity in two ways. So the first is something called uh, Psi 50, so that's shown here in the red, and that's the leaf water potential at 50% of the maximum. Um, so yeah, 50% decline of photosynthesis, that's what Psi 50 is. Beta is the um, sigmoidal slope of the equation, or the slope at Psi 50. So less negative Psi 50s mean declines in photosynthesis happen at less intense dehydration statuses. And a larger beta means this decline is steeper. Okay, so here I'm showing you the actual sigmoidal response curves of Amax to Psi leaf in my 10 eucalyptus species. Cooler colors represent species from your more music environments. Solid lines are um, subgenus eucalyptus and the dashed lines are subgenus symphiomertus. And what I hope you can see is that the Amax of these uh, moist habitat species decline um, more steeply and at less negative water potential than the um, species from more arid environments. Now let's compare the Psi 50s and the betas of the species to the moisture availability of the species' native habitats. Remember that's native PP, you know, more music environment. We found that um, both Psi 50 and beta correlate very strongly to the moisture availability of the native environment. Where plants from very wet habitats with high PEPs have less negative species and larger betas. And these relationships are statistically significant using ordinary simple linear regressions, which are your dashed line, and, um, phylog and phylogenetically structured linear regressions, which are your solid lines. And actually in the case of beta versus PEP, um, the two types of linear regressions are uh, give the same results. Um, additionally, we looked at any differences in intercepts and slopes between the two subgenera and found no differences. Um, and all of this indicates that there's convergence in these relationships um, in, within the two lineages. So uh, our conclusions on this are that species native to drier climates have more negative Psi 50s and smaller betas. And that means that their photosynthetic declines due to non-stomatal limitations during, during drought are less steep and happen at only at more intense dehydration statuses than in species native to more mesic environments. So these species with less, uh, less lower um, mesophyll photosynthetic sensitivity, they have an ability to perform photosynthesis through more intense periods of drought which is a huge advantage in dry environments. But does this resistance to drought have a trade-off? We found that species from drier habitats with greater mesophyll photosynthesis have lower rates of photosynthesis here on the y-axis and when photosynthesis is measured not during drought, so when water is readily available. So it's likely there's a trade-off between photosynthetic efficiency during non-droughted conditions and sensitivity to drought, where having decreased sensitivity to drought comes at the price of having lower photosynthetic rates when there isn't drought. 
So we found that species native to um, more music environments have greater mesophyll photosynthetic sensitivity to leaf water potential. And it may involve a trade-off with photosynthetic efficiency when water is available. Our findings provide the first phylogenetically structured comparative data relating differences in mesophyll photosynthetic sensitivity across a large set of closely related but ecologically different species. And we propose that mesophyll photosynthetic sensitivity may be a new dimension of plant adaptive evolution to drought. So now our question is, if mesophyll photosynthetic sensitivity can be considered a drought tolerant trait, how does it relate to the many other aspects of plant physiology, especially those traits that are considered to be drought tolerant? And how are these traits coordinated across the plant system? To answer these questions, we chose uh, a few hydraulic traits that have shown particular promise in understanding drought tolerance and in integrating many other physiological characteristics. The first I'll talk about today is something called turgor loss point. So this is the leaf water potential when cell turgor is lost and wilting occurs. Um, so for this you know, cartoon plant, um, we've got a hydrated plant, leaves with a uh, turgor, tur with Leaves have, tur tur I can't speak, have tur, there we go. Um, and as to more negative leaf water potentials, eventually we hit the point where um, tur is lost and the leaves will. So for this plant, it's like 2.5, 2.7, negative 2.7. Okay, so um, this tur loss point is one of the first traits plant ecophysiologists tend to measure when trying to understand plant drought tolerance. One, because it's actually super easy to measure. Um, and two, because it's highly correlated to many aspects of hydraulic functioning during drought in plants and to habitat aridity. Um, so species from drier habitats globally across the globe have more negative trigger loss points. And these species with more negative turgor loss points tend to have many other traits that allow for hydraulic and photosynthetic tolerance to drought. So then our question is, what are the turgor loss points of our 10 species? And how does turgor loss point relate to mesophyll photosynthetic sensitivity? Okay, within our eucalyptus species, um, so we've got turgor loss point on the y-axis and uh, the moisture availability of the native habitat on the x-axis. And we think turgor loss point is more negative as aridity of the species na native habitats increases. And this reflects global trends. Comparing turgor loss point now to Psi 50 Amax, remember that's our quantification of mesophyll photosynthetic sensitivity. These two are also highly correlated, where species with more negative trigger loss points also have more negative psi 50s. Here, these relationships are identical, whether using um, uh, regressions with phylogenetic contrasts or not. And so this tight correlation of mesophyll photosynthetic sensitivity to trigger loss point and to degree of aridity reinforces the importance of mesophyll photosynthetic sensitivity as a quantifiable measure of drought tolerance. I'll also point out that for each species, Psi 50 is more negative than turgor loss point. So that one. Um, so that means that uh, turgor loss point happens before photosynthetic inhibition. I can, I can draw that out a little more clearly here. Um, so as leaves become more dehydrated, um, first, and so wilting can occur, or wilting often occurs, then the margin before which non-stomatal inhibition occurs. And we can calculate the difference between these two points and call it the photosynthetic safety margin. And basically, it's how much of a buffer does the plant allow between turgor loss and photosynthetic shutdown. 
And something I think pretty cool we found is that species from more arid environments have greater margins than the species from more mesic environments. So they create more of a buffer between these two points. Okay, so the next hydraulic trait I want to get into is how plants behave in regulating water loss and leaf water potential as soils dry. The leaf water potential is greatly controlled by stomata. Remember that an extensive amount of water is lost through stomata when they open and transpire. So when a plant maintains stomatal openness as soils dry, any water lost is not as easily um, replaced, which means that leaf water potential declines. But stomata can behave more or less strictly in how they regulate uh, water loss and regulate the declines in leaf water potential. And this degree of stomatal control of leaf water potential differs among species. And actually, it, it's considered to the stringency falls along um, a continuum from isohydry to anisohydry, where your more isohydric species tend to close stomata strictly as soils dry, which means leaf water potential is more greatly regulated. A classic example of the, the very isohydric behavior is the pinion pine. So here we have open circles and midday leaf water potentials compared to um, over a year. So soils are drying, especially um, during the summer and fall months. So within this very isohydric species, um, constant uh, midday leaf water potential. So stomata are, are maintaining leaf water potential to be much more constant. And so they're behaving much more strictly in how they uh, regulate leaf water potential. Your more isohydric species, and um, a classic example of the very anisohydric behavior is um, the Utah juniper. Um, so them in solid symbols. Um, and so as leaf soils dry, leaf water potentials decline, um, or excuse me, so yeah, soil water potentials decline, the leaf water potentials tend to decline um, much more as soils dry. So those are can be considered your two extremes, um, but plants fall along, can fall anywhere along the continuum. And a way to place species along the continuum is using and calculating something called a hydroscape area. The hydroscape area is the water potential landscape over which stomata actively control and regulate leaf water potential prior to complete drought induced stomatal closure. So what you do is you measure leaf water potential in the middle of the day and soil water potential during a period of drought and compare their declines. So hydroscape area is the triangle formed by the linear um, decline of midday to soil water potential um, with the y-axis and the one-to-one -one line. So that's the triangle in the red. So more anisohydric species have much larger hydroscape areas. Here's what this look like, looks like with, um, within two of my eucalyptus species. So one on the left is very isohydric and has a very small water or hydroscape area. Effectively, stomata um, behave stringently as soil water potentials decline. And this minimizes the area of water potential landscape over which stomata do have active control. The species right has a over which stomata actively control water status and therefore is considered to be much more anisohydric. Previously, um, hydroscape areas um, have been looked at globally or across very distantly related species. And in general, these global patterns show that species with larger hydroscape areas, so your more anisohydric behavior, come from drier habitats, have more negative turgor loss points, have water transport efficiency, water hydraulic conductance that is less sensitive to drought, but have, in general have lower water transport efficiency when water in the soil is available. 
Um, so we have global trends, but we don't yet know how closely related species from different habitats are distributed along this isohydric to anisohydric continuum. Nor do we know how hydroscape areas and these other functional traits are related when coordinated or are related and coordinated when uh, analyzed in a phylogenetic context. And so while understanding global trends is often helpful, um, uh, is often helpful and useful, um, the universal application of global trends can be problematic because um, water use strategies are often context dependent or scale dependent or species dependent. And so one of the questions we have within our study system at Eucalyptus, um, uh, where our goal is to better understand hydroscape areas, um, and the isohydric to anisohydric continuum um, and see if there's, do they follow global trends? And we want to better understand how mesophyll photosynthetic sensitivity to leaf water potential relates to our quantification of stomatal regulation of leaf water potential. Um, we can expect that eucalyptus will follow global trends. And we can also expect that species with greater MPS, greater sensitivity to changes in leaf water potential. Um, so these have thus greater photosynthetic cost to any decline in leaf water potential. We can expect that they would have stomatal behavior that tends to minimize any changes in leaf water potential. So this would mean they would be more isohydric. Um, so here's how I did that. Oh, sorry, wrong school. <laughs> Um, so uh, on the same plants that I measured mesophyll photosynthetic sensitivity and turgor loss points, I also also measured um, midday leaf water potential and soil water potential as the plants were drying down. And I used this to calculate hydroscape areas. I also measured um, whole plant hydraulic conductance, um, and that's just the max water transport efficiency through the plant, and also um, quantified the vulnerability of water transport efficiency to changes in leaf water potential. So that would be um, Psi 50K plant here, and that's the water potential at a 50% decline in water transport efficiency. Our results indicated that the hydroscape areas we measured in the greenhouse um, correlated very strongly with the degree of aridity that the plants are native to. So plants from very mesic and high PEP hydroscape areas under which stomata, con stomata control things. And then species from drier habitats have larger hydroscape areas. These relationships are identical whether or not we use phylogenetic contrasts. And in this way, eucalyptus mirrors global patterns. We also found that hydroscape areas were extremely powerful predictors of plant hydraulic vulnerability to drought. Um, and this plant hydraulic vulnerability looked at with turgor loss points and this Psi 50K plant, um, the vulnerability of water transport efficiency in the plant. Um, and these trends also follow global trends where hydroscape area was negatively correlated with turgor loss points and whole plant vulnerability to loss of or to loss of hydraulic conductance. Okay. So in contrast to global trends, however, hydroscape area has no relationship to the maximum whole plant hydraulic efficiency. So this means that your more anisohydric species, safer, less vulnerable um, hydraulic transport are equally fast and efficient compared to the more vulnerable isohydric species. And we interpret this as suggesting that eucalyptus is highly opportunistic in its water use. So when water is available, uh, they very rapidly transpire water, irrespective of how tightly they would regulate leaf water potential if soils were to start drying. And that kind of makes sense. Eucalyptus is known to be an extremely fast growing species that sucks up tons of water. Um, ask anyone who has lived in California. Um, and we wouldn't have made this connection 
if we had simply accepted global trends. Okay, so now that we have a better understanding of hydraulic traits and hydroscape areas within our species, let's now move on to looking at how mesophyll photosynthetic sensitivity to leaf water potential relates to stomatal regulation of leaf water potential. Our results show that hydroscape area here on the x-axis correlates very strongly by 50A max or region of MPS. So plants with larger water potential landscapes under which stomata have control have photosynthetic inhibition at much more intense drought. While plants with smaller hydroscare areas have inhibition at less intense dehydration. Um, hydroscape area also correlated very strongly to beta, our other quantification of MPS. Um, here I had to do a log log or transformation to meet assumptions, but the, the trend is um, the same where speech with larger hydroscape areas and more anisohydric behavior tend to be less sensitive. So yes, we found that species with greater photosynthetic sensitivity to leaf water potential do exhibit more stringent stomatal behavior in controlling leaf water potential. Okay, so now let's reiterate what we have learned about mesophyll photosynthetic sensitivity to leaf water potential to non stomatal limitations uh, during drought. Sensitivity is greater in species from more mesic moist habitats, and there's potentially a trade off to having greater sensitivity, and that is having greater photosynthetic efficiency when water is available. And really, that makes sense. Plants with greater photosynthetic sensitivity come from places where water is readily available. So yes, the plants are more sensitive to drought, but that's not normally an issue in their native environments. And the likely trade-off for this sensitivity that, um, is that they perform photosynthesis at much larger rates when water is available, which for these sensitive productive species is most of the time. Now, the species that are less sensitive can't really compete when it comes to photosynthetic production in habitats where water is readily available. But in arid climates, they went out because they can maintain photosynthesis and photosynthetic production during drought when your more sensitive species have already closed stomata or are experiencing non-stomata limitations. We've also learned that this newly um, quantified drought tolerant trait is correlated with many other traits that allow for prediction in drought tolerance. And it's also tied to how plants behave in regulating leaf water potential and is coordinated with many other drought tolerant traits and hydraulic traits, although not always in ways that mirror global trends. But there are question, plenty, plenty of questions that we still have. Um, one, what are the mechanisms underlying these differences in our species? What causes mesophyll photosynthetic sensitivity? Um, so I didn't get into this today, but there um, are different types of non-stomatal limitations. And it's quite possible that um, some species are more inhibited by some aspects of non-stomatal limitations than others. And so that hasn't been looked at yet. Also, um, I've asked and other people in the lab had asked, what's the mesophyll photosynthetic sensitivity in other plant groups? Um, so one of my other chapters in my dissertation that I uh, couldn't get into today for storytelling reasons and um, time, uh, I've looked at sensitivity in some tree species from the Pacific Northwest. Um, but also I have been collaborating with some of the other people in the McCullough lab looking at MPS in fern species. So we're hoping to answer these questions um, and maybe one day we'll be able to come up with our own global trends of mesophyll photosynthetic sensitivity. And so when we start putting together all the pieces in how plants function, how these traits are coordinated and what that means in particular environments, we can start painting a more accurate picture of how plants, populations and ecosystems across the globe will respond to changing conditions. 
And when you create a, nov a novel way to quantify and understand plant physiology, you end up with a new way to model system functioning or a new trait that we can even start selecting for in certain environments. So with that, I have many, many, many people to thank. Um, and I words will not do me justice uh, in expressing my gratitude to all of you, but I'm, I'm gonna try. First and foremost to my advisors, Tom and Kate, this journey has been incredible. So Tom, you talked about coming forward with this idea. I remember looking at it, reading more about it and getting more and more interested and it's been incredible. You both have let me um, run off with this idea in incredibly cool um, and exciting directions. Um, and you've provided all of the support I've ever needed through all of this. So thank you so much. To my committee members, Cecile, Eric, and Simon, thanks for answering all of my random questions, for letting me pop in when I was confused on something or needed some direction. Um, so you've always provided useful insight and encouraged me not to shy away from more difficult analyses. Um, all five of you actually have led uh, one or two courses that I've taken while a graduate student, and um, they've always been super enriching, but also super fun. Um, so it was a pleasure being your student and um, having you on my committee. To um, the collaborators that uh, helped me and we worked together on a lot of these projects um, and other projects during my time in grad school, Duncan Smith, Mark Adams, and Frederick Meinzer or now found all over the world. Uh, thank you for all your help through data collection, through data analysis, um, and so much of the work that I talked about. Um, it's been really fun working with you. I've also had several undergraduate assistants who helped me with a ton of um, sample processing. Uh, some of it very tedious, such as grinding leaves and putting them into those tiny little tin capsules that always fall over a rip. So well done with that. Um, it's been really fun working with you and learning from you how to be a better advisor and manager. Um, and I'll, I want to give a special shout out to Sophie. So she did an incredible job um, looking at leaf vein architecture that I unfortunately couldn't go over today. But so it, it was really fun teaching an undergrad student what um, the skills that brought me into botany um, and plant sciences. Um, so I can't wait to see where you go in the future. Um, it's It's been fun to see it come full circle. Huge thanks to uh, all of the people who helped me keep my plants alive so that I could then kill them with drought. With the biggest of shout outs, obviously, to Kara and Ingrid from our own depart department. We are so blessed to have you helping you, helping me, us, the whole department with every question we need related to plants. Um, thank you to Lynn, Isaac, and Dina at the um, Walnut Street Greenhouses. Uh, it was <laughs> super great that I could find such a big space for all of my fast-growing plants. Um, and you helped me keep them alive here in Wisconsin. And then Joanna, who um, I think is the director at the D.C. Smith Greenhouse, um, so she helped me take care of the plants and not only that, found some space for them one spring semester where we could grow some extra plants um, and use them in one of the, the ecology courses that Kate and Eric taught where we got to do a lot of our own ecophys experiments with them. Um, so our resources here at UW are incredible and I'm so thankful to everyone um, who helped me navigate using them and you know doing my best um, here. Big thanks to all of the funding sources, especially to the Department of Botany. You were extremely generous in funding me on quite a few uh, field trips to Australia. That's uh, not a cheap flight, um, but also sending me to um, some conferences and letting me TA for uh, three semesters. Um, I learned a lot through my experience here and um, met some really amazing people. So uh, people have asked me a lot over the years what it's like having two different advisors, and I always reply that it is the best of both worlds. Um, Tom and Kate are incredible, and having two brains to pick, two people to laugh with, two people to be frustrated with when we have really annoying um, 
reviewers in papers or when experiments aren't working. Um, and I've had throughout these years two experts who pushed me to be my best in many different ways um, as both a scientist and as a person. So thank you both so much for everything that you have taught me and all of the memories that we've made. Huge thanks to everyone in the McCullough and Givnish labs. Um, we've always had helpful discussions, fun discussions. Um, thank you for reading some really bad drafts of manuscripts or looking at some not polished presentations. You have definitely helped me be a better scientist. Also, thank you for being a soundboard for me. Um, I think Stephen uh, Augustine will especially be able to tell you this um, as he sat next to me uh, the last few years, but I tend to think a lot more with my mouth than my brain. And so I would pester Stephen a lot, just making him listen to me so I could, could just think aloud. Uh, so thanks for dealing with me, Stephen, and everyone in the lab. It's been a lot of fun. Thank you for, uh, thank you all the friends I've made through uh, the botany department, all of the ecology field courses. So uh, Tom talked a lot about this, but oh my gosh, the time's going all over Wisconsin to the Smoky Mountains to Australia. It's been incredible, always with amazing people and incredible plants. Um, so thank you for that, those times. All of my FAC friends and friends I've made through um, PSGSC, you've made this experience incredible. Um, so thanks for being people to talk to, learn from, vent with, uh, play ridiculous games with. Um, my time here has been awesome and I can't believe it's now the chapter is closing. Um, so, man, I have so many shout outs, but this one's really important too. Um, during my time in grad school, I really took off with statistical programming and data analytics. Um, but I started grad school knowing nothing about programming and very little about statistics. Um, and it was Cecile, Jared, and Duncan who were my inspirations and gurus in becoming, uh, finding this passion and learning many, many, many new skills. Um, this dissertation would have been nowhere near as thorough um, without you, and it certainly wouldn't have been as exciting or enjoyable if I was alone in navigating our exploding and freaking out. Um, so thank you three so much. You are incredible. Uh, to my family and friends, thank you. Uh, I could not have done this with all of, without all of your support and love. Um, uh, grad school has up and downs and highs and lows and many, many emotions, especially for an emotional Italian human like me. Um, uh, and I, I couldn't have done it without you. Uh, so Chris, my now husband, um, he was uh, a huge help in moving heavy plants, in coming to help measure uh, the pre-dawn water potentials for soil stuff. Um, I'm not a morning person, but he always made sure I was there on time to collect the data. Um, and so, yes, Chris and I were able to safely get married during this crazy pandemic. Um, so, wow, has 2020 been an exciting and crazy and momentous year. So um, I'm glad I've survived it and I hope you all have too, man. <laughs> um, so my next adventure is a big new step. I'll be moving into a career in data science and marketing uh, at a biotech company here in the Madison area called uh, Promega. So now I'll be um, coming up with novel ways to study customer behavior um, and marketing campaigns uh, to understand how biotech can grow. Um, so I'll be here for the foreseen future, um, so I won't be a stranger um, once campus opens. Uh, and with that, I would be very happy to take any questions. <laughs> Thanks so much, uh, Amanda, for a wonderful talk. And uh, what a, a great piece of work. Uh, uh, people, you can um, uh, unmute yourself uh, if you want to uh, ask questions that uh, uh, Amanda can um, uh, address. And, and before we do that, let me just say that um, uh, for those of you who are interested, uh, we'll be having a celebration, a socially distanced celebration for Amanda on Thursday at 2 p.m at Owen Conservation Park. That's O-W-E-N on the west side. <clears throat> and um, uh, we'll, we'll walk around the park, which has a, a, a prairie and a savanna in flower right now. So questions, please.
Oh, well, thanks for all the congratulations, guys. Lots of congratulations. Yeah. In the yeah. Wow. Chat. <laughs> Apparently, you answered all Aww. the questions. <laughs> I mean, it was a perfect talk, so I. I, I, I question. <laughs> There's always that fear when you hear a long, long silence <laughs> that uh, no one can hear you. Chris has a question. Great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, so, great job. That was really excellent, kind of a model for uh, how a student's graduate career should go, so great job. <laughs> um, uh, very different than mine. <laughs> so my, my question is uh, kind of related to that graph you showed where you hypothesized that different eucalypt species could be opportunistic in their water use. Yeah. And so just kind of springboarding from that, I remember you talking about um, doing the dry down and doing some really some some incremental rewatering so you could capture that really well, which you did. Um, I'm wondering if you did anything further or thought further about how plants could recover and the speed that they can recover um, at different points of soil drying if you water them, did you get a sense just from that alone, from, from doing that experiment, or have you done anything further to try and understand if some of those plants can recover quicker or than others? Oh my gosh, I'm glad you asked this, and part of me feels like someone planted this question because it's so perfect. Um, so yes, we I did one, during some of my preliminary studies when I just looked at three species the summer before this big experiment, I did, so I put them through this uh, drought um, and for us, I'd say a, quite a few of them at the end of their drought, um, as close as I could get them to being super dehydrated without dying, I then rewatered them completely um, for two days and then remeasured um, the maximum rates of photosynthesis um, after two days of being able to rehydrate. And so I found that, and so the three species I looked at were at the two extremes of um, the moisture availability and then one in the middle, and all three of them were able to recover to full rates of photosynthesis. Um, wow. And so, so two days was enough, so you can consider that to be a, a nice full rain um, event. Um, but yeah, the next great question is, um, and so I, what we could see next is, does the recovery exactly follow the sigmoidal curve backwards, or is there like some type of new um, uh, bounce back? Um, that I don't have the answer to um, and would be a really interesting question. Yeah, and maybe the time too, right? So after two days, they were all recovered, but maybe some of them were recovered much more quickly than that. Yeah, totally. Yeah, so I, I only have the two days, but that would be an awesome next next step. Sweet. Awesome. Thanks for the, the answer. Yeah. Anyone else? <laughs> uh, my mom pointed out uh, one of the figures I showed um, had some interesting colors, and it was inspired by the Power Rangers and by the 90s Dixie Cup if you noticed that. <laughs> uh, let me make just a couple of additional observations. Uh, one is that um, um, Amanda's uh, results have, uh, I, I think, uh, uh, very broad implications uh, for plants around the world, but also uh, her, kind, her results could be built into models almost immediately uh, for optimal stomatal conductance uh, or root to shoot allocation. Uh, and of course, those characters have as with mesophyll photosynthetic sensitivity, big implications for uh, water loss, and ultimately for global climate. And uh, uh, secondly, uh, I think we should uh, give a shout out to Sarah Friedrich, who I think uh, helped uh, you on, on a number of the, of the graphics. Oh my gosh, uh, that's terrible, I should have said so. Oh, it's so okay. Here, I'm so sorry for forgetting. <laughs> She's been incredible. Everyone needs, to, well, everyone should use her as a resource. She's amazing, but just overwhelm him at her, so. I guess maybe I shouldn't say that so extremely. <laughs> there is a question in the chat from David Baum. 
Okay, so he, he asks is, about e or Viminalis being a bit of an outlier with a higher A max than you might expect from its PEP, and if you have any yeah. insight into that. Um, Particular, so, he asks, is it a recent invader of dry habitats? That's a great question. So yeah, that definitely did was an outlier for pretty much every single regression um, in comparison. And if I remember right, that was one of the species that had um, your, uh, the, so eucalyptus, a lot of the species have heteroblastes, I think is the term. So they have juvenile leaves and then adult leaves much later that look very, very different. And so with eucalyptus viminalis, all of my measurements um, were on the juvenile leaves. Um, so it could be that its adult leaves may behave more uh less like an outlier um that was one thought i feel like i had another answer to this idea and i can't remember it off the top of my head that, 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 sorry <clears throat> that's a cool answer <clears throat> so um do uh, were the other species that have juvenile and adult leaves that are morphologically different were they also the juvenile one there were one or two other um juvenile leaves within the species. Um, but this was one of the more extreme differences because it was quite quite thinly leaved um, mm -hmm. compared to its adult species. Um, so yeah, it is kind of interesting that none of the other ones did, but they weren't quite as extreme in the differences between adult and juvenile. Thanks. That's yeah, no, thank you for that question. Well, if there are uh, no more uh, questions, uh, let's uh, uh, first of all congratulate uh, Amanda on her presentation. I remember, remember the celebration at 2 p.m. On, uh, uh, on, on Thursday at Owen Park. If you're going to come, give me a drop me a line so I know how many people are coming. We need to keep below 25 participants to meet uh, Dane County uh, uh, regulations. Uh, and um, uh, then I think we'll, we'll adjourn and, and the, the committee members will stay online. Thank you so much for coming, everyone. You really showed up. This is amazing. Great job, Amanda. Congratulations. Yay. Yay. Congratulations. Peace <laughs> meeting.